Hello and welcome to the fifth video in the FINA 5000 DCF tutorial series. My name is Harrison Ham, and in this video I'm going to be helping you fill out the WAC portion of the spreadsheet. That way we can get a discount rate that we can use to discount our future cash flows. So basically our goal is to calculate the weighted average cost of capital. We do this first by calculating the cost of equity and the cost of debt. Then we use the weights of debt and equity based off the company's capital structure to combine these two into a weighted average. And that's why it's called the weighted average cost of capital. So the first thing we need to do is calculate the cost of equity. And we're basically just going to use the CAPM formula to make that calculation. So CAPM basically states that the cost of equity is equal to the risk-free rate plus beta times the equity risk premium. And all three of these things are things that we can actually just look up ourselves. So first we're going to look up the risk-free rate. And as a proxy for the risk-free rate, we're going to use the yield on a treasury bond. So the question is though, which treasury bond should we use? So first go and look up the yield curve, which you can find either at treasury.gov or a similar website. And it'll show a table that looks something like this, which basically shows what the yield curve looks like across the past couple of days. So then which bond exactly should you be using as your risk-free rate? We're well, gonna to wanna to use something that matures at the middle to end length of your forecast. So for example, in this forecast that I've been doing in the tutorial, we are projecting out the next five years. So we would wanna use either a three-year bond or a five-year bond as our proxy for the risk-free rate. But if you're projecting out, say, 10 years, you might want to use a 7-year or a 10-year rate because you're projecting further and further into the future, so the risk-free rate changes slightly because of that. But for the purposes of this tutorial, we're just going to use a 3-year treasury bond as our proxy. So we see that the percentage is about 0.44% for the risk-free rate. So we're going to go straight back to our sheet, and we're going to type in 0.44%. Make sure you type the percentage afterwards. Otherwise, it might think that you mean 44% instead of 0.44% which obviously is going to throw off your calculations if you make that mistake. Next, we're going to look up our company's beta and also the equity risk premium. So we can actually find these numbers straight off the overview snapshot page within FactSet. So just look up your company, go to the snapshot page. Then in the top right, it'll have this box of key statistics, including their calculation for the weighted average cost of capital. So you can click on the little blue link right next to it where it actually lists the weighted average cost of capital to see a breakdown of how they calculated it. Then you can expand this box that says cost of equity and looking through it you can see that they have a three-year adjusted beta and the market risk premium right here if you wanted to go more in depth you can calculate these numbers on your own but for the purposes of this tutorial you can actually just strip these numbers straight out of fact set and put them into your calculation so we see that the three-year adjusted beta is 1.15 and the market risk premium is 4.72 percent so we can take those numbers and just go ahead and put them right back into our spreadsheet 1.15 for the beta and 4.72% for the equity risk premium. Then all we have to do to calculate the cost of equity is use our CAPM formula, which is that the cost of equity equals the risk-free rate plus the company's beta times the equity risk premium. And we get that the cost of equity is 5.87%. Next, we need to calculate the cost of debt, which we're gonna do by taking the before tax cost of debt and then we are going to multiply that by one minus the tax rate in order to get our after-tax cost of debt. Now the straight up cost of debt, we can actually again draw straight from fact set in the exact same spot that we got the cost of equity. We can come down here and find the after-tax cost of debt and we find their before tax cost of debt right here once you expand it, which they say is 2.24%. So we can go back to our sheet, type in 2.24%. And then now for the tax rate, we're actually not going to use the same tax rate as what FactSet claims. We're going to use the tax rate that we actually calculated in our assumptions in order to be consistent across our entire sheet. So you can go back to the free cash flow sheet and then reference this effective tax rate that we calculated in one of the earlier videos. And then now to calculate the after-tax cost of debt, we just do equals 1 minus the effective tax rate times the before-tax cost of debt to get an after-tax cost of debt of 1.59%. So now that we have our cost of equity and our cost of debt, we need to actually combine these in a weighted average, but the question is, what weights do we use? So we're going to base our weights based off of the market values of debt and equity. So for equity, the market value is simply the market cap, which we can get by multiplying the shares outstanding times the current price. So for the shares outstanding, we're going to reference the shares outstanding in the assumptions on the free cash flow tab. And then we're going to do the same thing for price because we have it in those assumptions. So you just reference right over here where you have the current share price. And then you calculate the market cap by doing equals shares outstanding times the current price to get a market cap of $327 billion for Home Depot. Then for the market value of debt, 
we're not actually going to calculate the market value of debt per se, but instead we're going to use the book value of debt, which is a pretty good estimate of the market value of debt. But if you wanted to, you could actually calculate this number yourself in order to have a more accurate number on your spreadsheet, but that's totally up to you. So for the market value of debt, we're going to do equals and we're going to go to free cash flows. And we're again going to look in the assumptions and find where we calculated the value of debt. And we're going to use that as our value of debt going forward. So then to calculate the weights on equity and the weights on debt, you just do equals the market cap divided by the market cap plus the market value of debt. And then that gets you your percentage weight on equity. And then the weight on debt is simply one minus the percentage weight on equity. So that it adds up to a hundred. Now we have all the information we need to calculate the weighted average cost of capital. We simply do the cost of equity times the weight on equity plus the after-tax cost of debt times the weight on debt. And that gives us a weighted average cost of capital of 5.37%. So the weighted average cost of capital is arguably the most important thing you're going to calculate in this spreadsheet. The reason being that the WAC is what you use to discount all of your future cash flows back to today's terms. So very slight changes in your WAC can significantly change the valuation of your company. For example, if it's too low, then you could be significantly overvaluating your company. And the reverse is also true. If it's too high, then you could be significantly undervaluing your company compared to what the actual value is. So in order to do a little bit of due diligence, we're going to calculate the WAC in a slightly different way. That way we have two numbers to base our WAC off of instead of just using one. Because just calculating one number, there can be a lot of variability in it and it can cause a lot of problems where your valuations won't really make a whole bunch of sense. So the second way that we're going to actually calculate our weighted average cost of capital is using what's called a hurdle rate. So a hurdle rate basically assumes that equity investors require a 10% return on their investment when they invest in this company. And the reason for making that assumption is that the cost of equity is actually literally the required return that investors need when they invest in this company. So if we assume that they need a 10% return, then our cost of equity is going to be 10% instead of the 5.87 that CAPM would imply from our previous calculations. So now when we calculate our hurdle WAC, we're going to replace this cost of equity with our 10% hurdle rate. So we basically do the exact same calculation, except we replace the cost of equity with the hurdle rate. So we do the hurdle rate times the weight on equity plus the weight on debt times the after-tax cost of debt to get our second WAC using the hurdle rate of around 9%. So this is very different from the WAC that we calculated previously. So it shows that very slight differences in the cost of equity are very important for this company, which shows why it's very important that we actually use this hurdle rate in order to get a different WAC so we have a different idea of what exactly our best WAC could be for our calculations. So then now that we've calculated two different WACs, we are going to go ahead and reference these over here onto the free cash flow sheet. We're going to take the original WAC and just reference it right here where it says WAC. And then for the blended WAC, we're actually going to take the average of these two numbers. So we're going to do 0.5 times the WAC that we calculated using cap M plus 0.5 times the WAC that we calculated using our hurdle rate. So this gets us a blended WAC, which is halfway between the two numbers of 7.19%. And the reason for blending them both together, it makes it so that you get a more generalized WAC, something that's not on either extreme. It's not too large, it's not too small. It's hopefully right in the good range where you're going to end up valuing your company at a pretty fair value. So that concludes the steps for this video. In this video, we calculated the weighted average cost of capital using data that we got from FactSet. And then we also calculated the weighted average cost of capital using a hurdle rate. And then we blended the two WACs together in order to get a more generalized measure of the weighted average cost of capital. In the next video, we're going to actually use this weighted average cost of capital to start discounting our cash flows. And we will use the perpetuity growth method in order to actually get a price calculation for our company. Thank you again for watching this video and I'll see you in the next one.